but that's why we call you the uh, the Velvet Frog. Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Sorry uh, we haven't been around in a little while. Yeah, you, somebody's been busy. Some uh, of us have yeah. been you know, not cutting <laughs> off their fingers in the shop. <laughs> you get um, one guess as to who's, who's been busy. Been who's busy. the busiest? Do you know, I? so two things. One is I've st- decided to stop saying I'm busy. It's not that I'm not busy. It's just that who cares? Right. It's like my friends know that I'm busy. Why do I need to bellyache about it all the time? It's like we should all have such problems. And I, I've chosen all the things around me. So it's it sounds like a complaint and it's not. The trick is how to manage it. And if I can't manage it, then it's time to get less busy. There's but, a there's a whole th- th- there's a book about time management. that's like you should never say you're busy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I came to that on my own. And the other one I heard was. A Buddhist that uh, I had breakfast with recently said... You had a Buddhist for breakfast? We had a... Mm. They were delicious. Baby Buddhist. I said, make me one with everything. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. boy. Okay, we'll see you guys next (laughs) week. (laughs) This has been Um, a great show. uh, 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 She she runs... She's part of the organization called I Be Me, Inward Bound, that is a uh, youth mindfulness camp that one of my sons goes to. And it's a wonderful organization. And my son's gotten a lot out of it. And it's, uh, she, we were talking about it and I said, yeah, I've decided to stop saying that I'm busy. And she said, um, somebody recently said that busyness is the violence of our times. And I thought that is a really important way to look at it. Whether or not it's true for you, it is certainly easy to watch busyness have a violent effect on your life. Well, it's about it's an excuse to not make the time for the things that are actually really important instead of the garbage that we fill our life with every day. Yeah. And so uh, my, my, my method for dealing with the amount of stuff that I have is that I've actually started making the time at home really sacrosanct. Like I don't pull out the computer to do any work after, after six, uh, unless it's an absolute emergency. And that hasn't happened in weeks. Uh, I've been reading more novels I've been taking more time, taking more baths, taking more quiet time, drive without the radio. It really is just like in every way trying to, we've talked about this. Yeah, no, but, but it's like that part of the problem with the smartphone connected world yes. is that nobody has, nobody, you, you don't have the zero time yeah. that whether it was when you used to mow the lawn, now I have a podcast on. Well, can we, uh, can we link after this to that beautiful Louis CK uh, bit he does about using the phone for buying a phone for his daughter? No. Uh, oh, okay. well, yes, we can link to it. No, I've never okay, heard of it. You've got to okay, hear this. I'll go watch it's it. amazing. And he just, he talks about the fact that, you know, you're sitting there and thinking, oh, the loneliness is coming on. I better, I better drown it out with mm-hmm. my phone. <laughs> it's like being in the elevator yes. with other people. Well, it's a little serotonin machine. We all like them. Right. For a very right. And soon they'll reason. be on our wrists and they'll be like handcuffs yeah, exactly. for our attention. No, it's going to, as soon as it's in the iris scanner, then we're all screwed because everyone's going to have yeah. wandering eye and you're wondering what they're surfing while you're talking to them. That's when the lazy eye becomes a, uh, you know, a, a pro instead of a con on the evolutionary well, hierarchy. My, yeah, my I, I can I can selectively make either of my eyes lazy, well, yeah. and it actually makes people stop talking to me, and they don't know why. <laughs> that's good. That's a yeah, good I trick. Start to do that, and they're like, mm, they want to stop talking. And well, they, that's been a great show, guys. You, you wish you, you had so more much. time, but if only you were stuck in a reoccurring time loop. Ah, oh, well done, Norman. I'm Welcome waiting, to waiting Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. <laughs> I'm Adam, and I'm Norm. Hey guys, did you see Edge of Tomorrow? Because I didn't. A sp- Spoiler cast. <laughs> Spoiler cast. Spoiler cast. Um, yes, I saw Edge of Tomorrow uh, the day it came out. I was in New York with my Ooh. buddy David, and we had gone out to dinner for a lovely, a lovely meal in this Japanese restaurant in the basement of an office building. Oh, it was like you went past a security desk and he didn't say anything. And then you made a left before the elevator and downstairs was this fantastic Japanese, so Blade Runner. So do you think the security guard has like a dining profile in his head? Of <laughs> people that look like they're going to go rob the office building versus people who are going downstairs for Japanese food. I'm so sure he didn't. But if he did, he's like a great and amazing actor. It seems like a character, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I. Adam's seen it. Yeah. I saw it. I've seen it. 
But uh, Will, Will has, has not seen it. I accidentally read the book. Now, how do you accidentally read a book? Well, the book is called something else. The book is called, called All You Have to All You Need Is Kill. All You Need Is Kill, which is such a much better it's title. All, it was originally titled that too. All You Need Is Kill is amazing. Some yeah. marketing department was like, ah, we need to. Nobody's gonna know this is science fiction if we don't right. put a good name on it. Let's call it uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow is such a non-name. You could it's call a, anything Edge of Tomorrow. It's a very generic, but still descriptive name for Ish. the plot. I mean, look, even the poster of Edge of Tomorrow is ridiculous. It's very generic. It's, it could be, it is actually. Well, it's all like, Tom Cruise movies. But you know the fake, actually, and Tom Cruise's Twitter profile I love, running in movies since yeah. 1981. Um, he does a lot of running in this movie. And the poster really looks like the end of the player when they come up with that fake movie with Bruce Willis uh, and yeah. Julia it is Roberts. The most generic <laughs> two people posing in armor behind a dramatically lit backdrop. Yes. Um, but let's let's talk about Edge of Tomorrow, the movie. Okay. We're gonna spoil it. That's the fine. Movie. I, I feel like I understand the but high points of the Neither plot of us have read the book no. or read the manga, so Will can fill in well, how it might differ uh, from a source material. This is a blacklist movie. What do you um, mean a blacklist movie? So it was on the blacklist of films that were not made uh, in Hollywood. Uh, right? like so best unproduced screenplays. Best unproduced screenplays Interesting. That, as rated by all the, the so uh, readers. The screenplay has a lot going for it. There's some great characterizations. Bill Paxton is absolutely a scene stealer. Oh, can I guess? He is the grizzled sergeant of the squad yeah. yes. who has survived more campaigns than anyone else except for... Oh we no! Well, he's the, he's the one that he he's the one that first meets Tom Cruise when he wakes up in the morning, and he's like, you know, oh, I'm gonna send you different. to the squad. Yeah. So and, he's in command of the of all the squads, and he monologues, and he monologues constantly, and oh. so fun. I mean, you could just tell. I met Bill Paxton last year at Comic Con, and he's a sweetheart. But he talked about movie roles as like I had so much fun on that one, oh. and I mean, you could just tell he is absolutely having a blast every day he's showing up he's having fun with these lines and Bill Paxton bookend. just to be clear Hicks yes Hicks from, from Aliens. Aliens no not Hicks uh, and Big, I mean Hudson sorry, Hudson, sorry. Hudson Jesus, we Aliens. just had the whole conversation Hudson and uh, Big Love the yeah. most amazing show so this is his bookend to Hudson mm -hmm. where in Hudson he plays the kind of game over man insubordinate why like, did you put her in charge yeah, yeah send the android here he plays the sergeant right who, who yells at everyone else yes oh, um, perfect I, I will say I found Edge of Tomorrow enjoyable. It suffers no scrutiny whatsoever. That's okay. It, it is a perfect well, time travel movie. Popcorn flick. No, it, this, it, this is particularly egregious because it falls apart in the first moment that the movie's plot is kicked into action. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Because I can sci-fi apologetics this. Explain to me your nitpicking, and I will explain it away <laughs> okay. within the logic of the movie. Oh, this is an interesting This is challenge. Norm's superpower. Okay. So, Tom Cruise sets in motion his ability to reset the... So, the aliens that they're fighting have the ability to reset the day. So, every time they lose, they can, boop, go back to the beginning of that day and figure out why they lost and undo that. And in the book, they explain that as sending information back into time. Right. Not... Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. in the movie, it just wakes up and it's Groundhog Day yeah. every day. So Tom Cruise gets this ability when he kills a, uh, a slightly higher up alien and it bleeds on him as he dies. The bleeding didn't happen, the, but everything else. And the bleeding gives him the ability to yeah. reset the day. Okay. Yes. So then he's able to reset the day and he goes through that day a few dozen times before finally meeting Emily Blunt and like working with her. And she says meet me when you wake up and he she starts to fill him in on this power he has is this on the first meeting no no oh, it's okay. multiple multiple meetings okay. over and over and over say. again so she starts to fill him in on the power he has and says she no longer has the power she had it in verdun where she like destroyed a bunch of aliens but she no longer has it because of some blood transfusion or something so yes. my question is take her back to the goddamn big alien that gave him the power and give it to her He's not that smart. Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, it was the first place he went. On. I got this one, Norm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Once the, once the blood hits the, of the alien hits him, he's locked in until the criteria that he has to fulfill to get out of the loop end. He's there, in the loop. There are two lines of dialogue that solve this, where he says he doesn't want the power. Why can't he just blood transfuse it back to her? Yeah. And she says they've tried everything. Hold on. Does the movie end with him killing her? No. No. Oh, because the book... We're gonna, oh, no. By the way, spoiler in the book too. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get to the ending, and, and yeah, that's that's a that's a point. A, a weakness uh, she's of the tried movie. everything except that. So you think that the, you think the loop is specific to one entity 
it's per back battle? to the future, right? It's, so once he goes back in time, then that loop branches off and it's a different loop and he he, he keeps using the same loop mm. until they close the close the okay. loop. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So he can't Don't think about he it too one, hard. Can't give, yeah, it's just, it's he just, can't give the power to her and two, it wouldn't matter if they went back to the alien to bleed on her. Okay. I want to talk about something you said a couple of days ago when we were talking about doing this podcast, um, which is you said Emily Blunt apparently had a little bit of a difficult time on this movie. Yeah. And I wanted to hear about that because I love her and I don't want to think about her having a difficult time. So it's directed by Doug Lyman, who directed yeah. Swingers, Born Identity. Uh, Doug, Mr. an amazing Smith, director. Doug Lyman's director. brilliant. He's, uh, has some he has directed a dud or two. Yeah. Yeah. For Mr. example. Smith. Uh, the, I like that movie. <laughs> it is a bad movie, but it is no, a likable bad movie. It's very likable. It yeah. is very likable. Vince Vaughn yelling at his mom and Brad Absolutely. and Angelina are just, I mean, they're compelling no matter what, but the movie is plot wise, oh, light yeah. as a feather. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> I love Emily Blunt. I think she is yeah. wonderful. Um, she's very versatile. I thought that it was a, she was originally supposed to be cast as the Black Widow in uh, Iron Man 2 before oh. Scarlett Johansson. Hmm. And it was a fan favorite where, and can you imagine Emily Blunt with her, like she has that great stare. Yeah. Like she has. Uh, the Devil Wears Prada I'm not going to say uh, resting bitch face, but like she has oh, a. She does have bitchy resting face. Totally. Uh, yeah. She can grimace. And resting she can bitch face norm. That, that's a thing. No, B- bitchy resting, bitchy face. resting face. Sure. <laughs> it means something completely different the other way around. Resting bitch face. Yeah. Oh, well, the dog is sleeping. One's a meme uh, and the other yeah. something you don't ever want to say to your girlfriend. Yeah. And anyway, <laughs> uh, she could not do Iron Man 2. Because? Because she was committed to that Gulliver's tale. The one with Gulliver's Jack Black? Travels? Gulliver's Travels. Oh. That terrible Jason Segel, yeah. Jack Black movie. Also, <sighs> she didn't want to do action. She didn't want to be stuck into a movie franchise. Her mistake. Scarlett Johansson's great well, Actually, I think Scarlett and- Johansson's great. And, I mean, she doesn't do much in Iron Man 2, but she, Scarlett Johansson's fantastic. In the, in the new Soldier. Captain America, yeah. And, and yes, 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 wonderful. She does um, some really and was great, good, complicated, good in Avengers excellent acting. That My point being Sorry. that it, it, she had not done a big action movie like this before. Right. Up in this. Well, and she said like 10 years ago in an interview. She did. If I ever do an action movie with Tom Cruise, just shoot me or something well, like that. She said, I would rather do like terrible theater or something. I right. have a terrible career than be a spear holder in a Tom Cruise action movie. And then someone called her out on that. She says, oh, at least I, I was holding a sword, not a spear in this one. Oh, it's a sword? Well, it's not even an axe? It's no, it's actually. Actually, a helicopter blade. Fuck. Uh, they ruined the goddamn no, book. A, she has a giant sword. Yeah, but it's, it's a helicopter blade. Okay, oh, yes. You they, yes, yes. That's how they made Oh, man, I didn't even notice that. That's great. <laughs> that is great. It's but a wait good, a second. I want to also talk about, a little bit about, the Trinity problem, which is they introduce, they spend all this time setting up this female character who's amazing and super badass in Emily Blunt just like Carrie Ann Moss's Trinity, only to have her arrive and hand off all the badassery to the male hero of the film for the rest of the movie, requiring rescue repeatedly. She doesn't require the rescue. They make her a she damsel in about, the movie? She not, she not, no, she's not a damsel. Not at all. She's not a damsel at all, but... So in the book, the the battle bits go back and forth between them constantly. Like they're both back to back against hordes of the mimics, right? Are they called mimics in, in, in the movie? Yes, it's mostly okay. him doing the problem solving. It's mm. it, well, you see his journey. Uh, but to go back to your point yeah. about her having a problem with shooting, Doug Lyman's shooting style is very gorilla. The, the beach scene, they had to scrap a full day of shooting and talk about expenses, right? Wow. Um, and Why would they have to scrap a full day of shooting? Because he did, wanted to shoot differently the second oh, day. wow. And so adding on a production, uh, they built that whole beachfront, which oh, is they released it on the anniversary of D-Day, first of all, <laughs> and had it, you know. Classy. And, and, and there was a stole the... To, storming the beaches of Normandy in the movie. Um, but she, there was an anecdote where he was just yelling at her to, and she couldn't handle it because, I mean, he was yelling at everyone. Nobody right? likes getting yelled but at. She had just never made a movie like that before. I don't like getting yelled at. Yeah. No. I tried, I've tried. i spent my entire life avoiding getting yelled at. <laughs> Have you ever, actually, my friend Paul F. Tompkins talks about, they has a whole routine talking about that. It was like, we... <laughs> <laughs> this just he tells this wonderful long story about being at a table read for a Paul Thomas Anderson film and getting to this house and looking at it and thinking, that looks like a house that someone would yell at me in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I know exactly how he feels. Yeah, why would you walk into that door? <laughs> so oh, they Paul set Anderson her up movie. as yeah, the okay. big badass. And right. They have like, she's the war hero, the war yeah. angel. And uh, it's explained why that is because she had that power before Tom Cruise. Well, but the, yes. the point... To, 
sorry, to, to learn all those abilities. Yeah. Um, you, to your point that she doesn't get to show off those abilities, I think she, there, there are some montage scenes. I don't think she needs to be rescued so much, so much as without that power, she's just a normal Let grunt. Me just, well, but the, right, but, but, but that's problematic, right? It is slightly problematic. I, I just... I, I, I recognize you can talk, one can talk their way out of that, but I also, you know, it, it is, it is a classic Hollywood thing. They, to not make them equal. What's uh -huh. on film, right? right? That's where you get, end up. It, exactly. It, I mean, the, it, the book is really explicit. Like there's no special powers. You don't, you go back in time, but the power all comes from Knowledge. dying and living and dying and living. Right. In his case, like 270 times in her case, up 212. Right. Right. And the something like, like that. Did you, did you ever see that thing that uh, Harold Ramis said about how many times Bill Murray repeated? Groundhog at least Day? 10 years. Yeah. yeah at Maybe least more 10, like 25. Yeah. yeah. Which you get that sense in this movie because you the they definitely do a good job at allowing you to feel like the resets are happening much more rapidly than you're seeing and that he's gone through trial and error thousands hundreds of times yes um and they do a good job not saying oh how many how many how long we've we been stuck in this loop and no dramatic i've been stuck here for does years. he not write the number on his hand no, no. oh in the no. book he has the he writes the number first thing he does in the morning every time is write the number on his hand. oh nice um yeah i will tell you that i think tom cruise was making an in joke about tom cruise when he is, when he is doing the push-ups and rolls out of the way to get behind the truck and gets run over that first time, yeah. you hear him go "son of a bitch," which is like Tom Cruise says that in so many movies, <laughs> and with that high-pitched "bitch" at the end, I can't do it quite that high-pitched. I believe I, I appreciate in his in his older years that Tom Cruise could still open a movie and yet make fun of. The arc of his career. He has to be time. like movies have become self-aware in the time yeah, that he's been exactly. making movies. Yes. Like, thanks, Joss. Um, <laughs> so the movie that one of the successes is editing because they don't tell you how many times he's done it. Right. It is a Groundhog Day esque movie where things have to be repeated, like Bill Paxton's monologue, mm -hmm. certain scenes. But in the writing and the editing, it doesn't feel as repetitive as it could. Be. Do they actually repeat? Like, are they reshooting each day? Or is it they that they just reuse the they, they do, Paxton they, they monologue? They do a very good job at letting you know you're seeing the same day again without ever letting you be bored at seeing the same scene again. Like the, the book was like one of the things I love. So I love kind of like I, I don't know enough about where this book falls in Japanese fiction, yeah. but I kind of assume it's in the same place as like the Battle Royale novel, which if you've never read, yeah. and you've only seen the movie is, is a fascinating exercise in how do you make a kind of shitty movie off of a, uh, an amazing book. Right. Um, interesting. And, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, kind of pop fiction is what I assume. Yeah. It's not something that's, it's not like Murakami where, you know, you're just reading this and you're feeling enlightened. This yeah. is just a trashy action novel. Well, I think that I, I also think the film does well with the, uh, with the twist at the end with the twist. Not at the, yeah, no, not at the very end, but the twist when he thinks he's gotten to them and he hasn't because oh, yeah, yeah. they've actually yes. been tricking yes. him. Okay. This is a spoiler it's, cast. Yeah, it is. A spoiler what's, what's the twist? So, uh, the twist is that he finally gets to where he thinks the Omega is and it's not there. And it turns out that the aliens are already hyped to his ability to reset the day. And they're trying to trick him. Oh, the whole thing's a trap. Just right. To draw and they're him trying out. to okay. get him to where he thinks the Omega is. And then they're going to keep him alive. And so that they blood. screw his ability to reset yeah. the day. Yeah. And they're going to go. Uh, yes. It's, so he has to die to reset the day. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Which is. is huh. that, and, in the book? and the stakes no, building at seem, the end never, where never comes he up. does get the power taken from him. So he has one last chance to make mm -hmm. it all work. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, that rate definitely raised the stakes. I totally. I, I get the feeling and this isn't being confirmed that they changed the ending. Uh, they absolutely. In the, oh, in the in the movie, in, in the movie, what was the ending in the book, the ending in the book is she realizes that she she's outside of his loop. Right. Yeah. She lives. So she meets him every day for the first time. Right. Like 50 first dates or Groundhog yeah. Day. Yeah. And um, and she realizes when she finds out that he has the he's stuck in the time loop because she's also of the time traveling kind of person. Yeah. All the antennas, all like there, she discovers the order of operations for getting outside of the loop, and it involves doing this and then killing all these antenna monsters, mimics. They all look exactly the same in the book because it's a book. And then you have to kill the main mimic, and then you have to kill all the rest of them because any one of them can carry it on. So they go through this whole process where they do it all in the right order. They kill all the mimics, and then he goes, he dies, wakes up, goes to sleep, whatever. The day ends with no explanation. And then he wakes up and does it again. Sonny and Cher playing the next morning. So when she, he comes and tells her this, this, the next day, 
she realizes, even though it's her first pass through the loop again, and she's like, so they go have a nice day. They go on a date, whatever, you know, sexy bits happen. Yeah. And then she, at the end of the battle, or as the battle's wrapping up, once they've done the main part, she's like, okay, it's on, we're fighting. And they fight for an extended period of time through the massive base, causing massive amounts of destruction Why? because she and he are both are the two last antennas. Oh. So you have to kill all the antennas and each and of them really are an other. antenna. So only one antenna can survive. And that's the person who gets out of the loop. Oh, wow. Very it's Blade fucking Runner. great. It is a great ending. And Norm that's came intense. in and was talking about how the ending was lame. Like it was the most Hollywood of Hollywood endings, oh, the, right? The ending like, is the two hilariously Hollywood. Yeah. Right. And then he has the biggest plot hole in the movie where when he dies at the end of the movie uh he the conceit where he gets the omega's blood yeah and somehow he's jumped not to the last time uh, to the, the yeah the, the so base. my guess was that that was the ending and then they're like yeah let's have him meet or, the girl or, again. or my guess right or, or my guess is that you know she dies some sacrifice is made right and she has to die right right um, right so hold on it's unclear what happens at the end no no, no, no. what happens oh. at the end is he saves the day the Omega's blood in, injects him and the day resets and now the war is over. Yeah. And he and goes to see her earlier. and she's like, what do you want? And he's like, <laughs> and credits. then they cut to credits. That is fucking terrible. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he does a Tom Cruise smile. He does a Tom Cruise smile. It is a big white smile. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, this book had a good ending. <laughs> Complicated um, endings are easier to achieve in books, I guess. I really it's, like the alien creature design and animation. What do they look aliens. like? They, oh, like frogs. Oh, they, Would you describe it as a, a squishy a frog? A, you know how Keanu looks when his mouth is sealed in the Matrix yeah. and he tries to open it. Now picture his face looks sort of like a gargoyle and it's white and he's got tentacles and stuff and it's almost like. Um, uh, there's like um, heat haze uh, distortion in Ooh. front of his face, and he's blowing blue smoke out of his mouth, sort of like that. And then it, also moving really fast. Oh, also moving very fast. So it's yes. with it, like millions of tentacles. It's and, of, yeah. And the, can they shoot things that like take people's heads off and all that stuff? Pseudopods. D like, d is it is this a situation where it takes hundreds of, of dozens of good guys, humans, to kill, to kill a one. single one? No, the, the, they show many situations in which one one soldier can kill one mimic, but, but they they're move. wearing this these exo suits. Yeah. That give right, they have to have powers. the exo suits. Yeah, right. And um, the exo suit stuff was great. I love uh, the, the the movie was surprisingly funny. There was a, a lot, lot that's very funny. Humor. As they keep on dying, as they're trying to pick their way through the thing, it's very entertaining how many times they get flummoxed just by missing one little thing. Like, and and there's are they, point, they're, and they're literally like dodging as like bullets fly by their heads and ducking as like things swoop over them. It's very funny. Well, so in the book, he makes a, the protagonist is this is a, basically in this one, as I understand it, he's a like general or something major that gets sent back to the lines. Yes, because he's, he's an a, asshole. He's or a something. PR guy. Okay. So that's actually, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say in the book, he starts out as like new recruit night before his first battle. Oh. And, he, and he's like, this is like a video game. I just keep going out and dying over and over again. I get better every day. Well, so yeah, I'll tell you something is the opening of the movie, the first 10 minutes is the worst part of the movie. I, I turned to my friend David and I was like, I don't know who I'm supposed to give a shit about in this movie yet because nobody... Tom Cruise he's is likeable. unlikable. He's a coward, but I think it's a but meta he's not even he's, he's not even interestingly not likable. It feels like someone, it feels like, well, this is the best we can do with this, but we don't want to make him too unlikable because we want you to like him later. And it was, it just was, it felt a little, look, I, you know, it always feels a little bit disingenuous to be picking apart a movie like this from the outside. These are hundreds of millions of dollars spent on some of the most expensive humans on the planet to make yeah. a, gar a gargantuan circus of a film. So all sorts of shit can go wrong. But you got to get the audience in the first five minutes or you don't have a movie. Yeah. Star Trek. That, There's a know, reason the bang. cold open exists. Yes. And the cold open in this movie just doesn't capture you to want to know what is going to happen to these characters. I'm really excited. Adam, don't worry. They focus tested it enough to know that that was the best possible. You know, they did one where they showed the end of the movie. They did right. one where they showed a battle <laughs> sequence from the middle where something funny happens. Yeah, they did yeah. one where he kisses the girl. You know, that was the best one. You, you saw it. They Scientifically did determined. Yeah. I'm sure they did a voiceover. You know, uh, I really appreciate David Cronenberg said he loves audience testing. And the interviewer was like, serious. And he was like, well, who the 
who the hell am I making movies for? I want to know what the audience yeah. wants out of a movie. And I appreciate that. Now, I mean, that being said, he still makes difficult <laughs> movies that are intense, but he, he likes the process of getting that feedback. So, um, like this movie reviewed really well. It really and it had yeah. just performed very poorly. Very poorly. Oh, it did perform yeah. poorly? Yeah. Both Oblivion, which is the last Tom Cruise science fiction action movie, and this movie. I would say I thought Oblivion was better. I think stylistically, I Oblivion. Uh, Oblivion, made Oblivion by, is beautiful. Yes, so beautiful. Oblivion. Absolutely gorgeous. And, and ripe for prop making and ripe for. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, gorgeous and, stuff. Really well and done. Sound design. Mm -hmm. Oblivion, an amazing sound design. Really um, good robots. Story any good? Yeah. Uh, it's derivative. It's all right. It, it, but itself, yeah. But uh, actually, I also. The there's a new kind of um, starlet coming out over the past few years, and it's the the girl in Oblivion is absolutely beautiful, but not in not in that sort of perfect porcelain Nicole Kidman mold, but more in sort of like the Shailene Woodley mold, mm -hmm. right? This is like I mean, it's so I, funny I you mentioned Shailene Woodley because it was her movie that destroyed. Tom Cruise's The Edge of Tomorrow. Oh, oh, it was uh, The Fault, Fault in, in Our Stars? Opened the same day as Edge of Tomorrow and did double. Wow. And yeah. that movie cost like 50 bucks to make or something. Yes. Wow. Oh, man. Is it a Nicholas Sparks book? No, it's uh, the John Green book. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why? Um, but anyway, I so I, I think the girl in Oblivion was fantastic and really lovely. And no, she's a Bond girl. Is she? Oh, the new one. She's the new Bond girl? No, no, no. no. She girl? was in uh, the bad Bond movie. Quantum uh, Solace? Quantum of Solace. She was the one who died in the hammock. Spoilers for that, too, by the way. No, 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 no. Oh, she, she was, was the, the other girl? The, the one who died in the hammock was the Prince of Persia uh, girl. Uh, <laughs> no, no, nobody about, knows what you're talking about. Oh, Norm. yes. No, I know who you mean. You're it's Olga. Um, yeah, Olga Karlyev. Uh, yes. Uh, she's Russian. Yes. Um, she oh, was in Quantum of Solace as the one who gets the vengeance. Yes. Um, she is the f female lead in Oblivion. Unless you're talking about the other female lead. Oh, I'm talking about the one up in the house. Okay. Are you an effective yes. team? Okay. That's the one I'm okay. talking about. So Not the Summer Glau Im uh, impersonator. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. We're making all sorts of friends today, guys. <laughs> oh boy. Um, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, yes. That's the one of my favorite about. lines in Big Bang Theory is when um, Kuthar Pali meets Summer Glau on the train and his opening line is it's hot in here it must be summer <laughs> oh boy Jesus that is a hell of a line <laughs> how do you uh, the actress I'm you're so talking glad about, I'm not a woman um, what's that Andrea something is yes. her name uh, from Oblivion she is fantastic she is fantastic she is well, fantastic and I totally get what you mean with the the, the, the mold, the, the... Look, act. I mean, I'm quite sure that if you met any of these people in person, you'd be like, oh, oh my God, I just can't even look at them. Like, the light shining from their face is just blinding yeah. me. I mean, you know, these are these are not human You're people. You're saying they're, they're attractive they're, people. What's that? You're saying they're attractive people. Yeah, but I mean, like, I mean, if, you, if you've ever met, like, a movie star in real life, yeah. like, they're usually twice as attractive in person. I mean, it's like, look, I met Rick Santorum and he's handsome. Look, I've met, I've met directors who are twice as attractive as you expect them to be, right? <laughs> yeah, like exactly. Like they're charisma, all more man. attractive people. Charisma yeah. is real and it's yeah. terrifying. Right. Len Wiseman around apparently it. smells really nice. What's that? Len Wiseman apparently smells really nice. <laughs> did, did you read, there was a beautiful blog post from uh, Jennifer Lawrence's best friend who was her date last oh, year at great. the Oscars. It was a fantastic post. Talked about meeting Brad and Angie. And she said she at one point after hanging out for a while, she turned to Brad Pitt and she was just like, no, now that we're buds. She was like, what is the cologne you're wearing? Because it smells incredible. And he's like, I, I don't use soap and I don't use cologne. I don't use anything. And she's like, she in the blog post, she's like, seriously, Brad, whatever you've got, bottle it because the whole world wants to smell it. <laughs> oh, boy. You de Pitt. <laughs> yeah, oh, de Pitt. Um, nice. Well done, Will. Uh, welcome to so, Still at Night. <laughs> Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hey, thanks for joining us, <laughs> yeah, everybody. It's a good show this week. Um, so Edge of Tomorrow, like, I, I just, I'm just bummed when a, a science fiction movie that reviews well, seems like it's pretty, pretty well thought out, maybe a couple of holes, comes out and it doesn't do well in movie theaters. I get a little bummed out because we had a long stretch there where nobody made big budget science fiction movies True. because they bombed. Yeah. And it would be a shame if this was part of the same trend. Yeah. But maybe they should make smarter ones. When was the last good I, science I, fiction I, movie? I will say that hiring the Looper director to That's direct much. Star Wars 7 and 8... Well, Sorry, talk eight, about nine. Brilliant. The, the elephant in the room. Yes. Wow, Ryan really? Johnson. How did I yeah. miss that? 
Ryan Johnson rewarded for directing Looper by directing Star Wars 8 and 9. That's and fantastic. Writing. Isn't and that writing. great? Yeah, and writing brilliant. it. And, and again, Looper's another film that survives no scrutiny of its time travel whatsoever, yeah, but he would, he would really defend, enjoyable. He would defend that. Uh, he has defended it. That commentary is worth listening to if you have Okay. Yeah. I will watch it's it. It's good. I mean, I look, I I'm not saying I don't love that film. I love it. It's beautiful. Brick was better. I love Brick. Brick is so well. Love Brick, Brick. Brick is square in your alley, though. Brick is totally my alley. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's so good. I think we should wrap this up. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week. Oh, actually, we may not. Uh, well, hopefully, we'll be back next week. We're gonna try. I'm gonna try and make the time. Right now, schedule's a little tough. For, it might be. Well, maybe we have to do it on Saturday or something. We'll figure something out. <laughs> um, but we will definitely be back around Comic Con, yep. if not sooner. Oh yes. And uh, as always, like us on iTunes, YouTube, and re- give us reviews, feedback. We love feedback, comments, whatever. We love. Uh, you. We'll see you guys later. Bye, guys. Bye.